Sekiro Shadows Die Hard is a very therapeutic game, which is why I see myself replaying it at least once a year ever since it came out a few months ago in March 2019. Out of all the From Software games, even though this is not the one with the highest hour count by my part, it is certainly one that I feel I'm the best at, and for that reason I took it upon myself the task of doing a zero death run in the game that literally has died twice in its name. And through many, many, many attempts I learned a few interesting things. This is less of a guide and more of a documentation of my process for doing this run and how much I struggled at it, but it was a blast to make nonetheless. Sit back, relax and grab a snack, this is going to be a long one. Let's start from the very beginning, at the bottom of the well. This first area is just a tutorial, and it serves to teach you the basic mechanics you'll be using for the rest of the game. Our objective is to get to that tower over there, but we're gonna take it slowly as to not alert the guards because my ability to run is tied to me holding my sword. There isn't a lot to comment on this area, so I'll just take this time to explain the rules and the origins of this run. Back in June 2022, I was watching an old stream from Vox Akuma and he was giving a go at a zero death Sekiro run. Since I had the game and I loved it so much, I thought I would be up to the challenge, and then I proceeded to not do anything until December when I actually picked up the controller and revisited the game. I must have tried like 30 times dying at various points in the game, my best run completed like 90% of the game only to be unceremoniously killed by a late game boss which became the bane of my existence, but we'll get to him later. In Vox's stream, he had the simple objective of completing the game without dying, which is a perfectly valid goal. However, I am a bit of a masochist, so I made a few additional conditions for myself. For the purposes of this run, I am to complete the game without dying while killing every boss and miniboss and claiming every idol in the map. This implies that I have to do the purification ending, where I have to fight an additional two mini bosses and a secret boss, as well as every single piece of optional content in the game, from mini bosses to bosses to whatever you can think of. I can use whatever tool I have available at my disposition, so prosthetics, sugars, etc. And if I'm capable of getting rid of a mini boss's first HP bar through stealth, that is valid. The only thing I'm not allowed to do is to use any bug or exploit, but everything else is fair game. One of Sekiro's core mechanics are these little pink circles at the bottom left part of the screen. Those are your resurrection counters, and a way I found to validate this run is that they don't appear unless you die for the first time. So, the win condition is depleting the final HP bar of the final boss while not having these little circles on my screen. And as a little bonus incentive, I swore on my dog that I would not start armor card before I finish this run. Guinea Boy is our first boss. You get nothing from beating him other than bragging rights, on this first part at least. But in the end, he's nothing more than one of Front Software's favorite tropes. The boss that is meant to beat your ass in the beginning of the game so that you can one day come back and beat his ass at a later stage of the game. However, by the end of the game, Genichiro is nothing more than a pebble you have to kick in order to get to the actual final boss, so it's not uncommon to see people who have already played this game making him look like a complete pushover. But that's not to say that Genichiro is an easy boss, by no means. As a matter of fact, his second fight is the place where most players will be hard walled at for the first time. He took me at least 40 tries to beat him the first time I played because, essentially, you cannot beat him unless you have a very good grasp at the fundamentals of the combat system. But fortunately, that hasn't been the case for me since 2019, so let's just get this over with, shall we? Alright, welcome to the dilapidated temple of the Ashina outskirts. This is our main hub area, and what I usually do here is that I talk to the sculptor following strictly this exact dialogue order, because if you select the second one first, he'll say that he's already talked too much and tells you to leave. You can still talk to him after that, but it hurts my fifis and breaks my roleplay. After you're done talking with the sculptor, he'll tell you to go talk to a strange man on the other side of the temple grounds. You're a training dummy. For the purposes of this run, we will not talk to this man. The bare minimum I expect of someone who's doing a zero death run is to not need to practice the basics. But if you're just getting started with the game and you're learning the fundamentals, this guy can be a lifesaver. Anyways, ignore him, get the coin pouch at the back of the temple and off you go. Ashina Outskirts is the first official area of the game, and it follows that the enemies you'll find here will stick to simple patterns in terms of combat, numbers, positioning and patrol route. To minimize the chances of dying, there are two things we'll make heavy use of in this run, those being, respectively, stealth and tomfoolery. One interesting thing that I found out after practicing this part of the game many many times is that provided you kill and loot every enemy and find all the coin pouches in this area, by the time you get to the first merchant of the game you have around 700 sen, which is enough to get 4 pellets and the firecracker prosthetic. The firecrackers are by far the most useful NOP tool in the game, is what someone who plays this game casually would say. They are pretty good against a few bosses, but in most cases you'll trade two spirit emblems for hitting an enemy once before they up their guard again. 
There are better ways and more cost effective ways to exploit the enemy's moveset to properly slay them, and I prefer to save my spirit emblems for using situational tools that are devastating against a few certain enemies, and for the theatrics of my boss montages of course. That's not to say that they're not useful, they are pretty useful if you want to make a window to heal. That is the chained ogre over there. I was stuck on this motherfucker for like 1 or 2 days before I finally beat him the first time I was playing. We'll come back to him later. This is the first time where we'll have to change our route for the sake of optimization. I have no idea if what I'm doing is actually more optimized, I'm just doing what works best for me. Talk to this lady, then head back to the temple to meet with Emma. She is our precious maiden in this desolate land, though unfortunately she isn't barefoot like in the other games. A little curiosity about her that I found out after some time playing this game is that she's dubbed by the same Japanese voice actor for Schwartz. I love her even more for that. Alright, let us proceed to the one and only optional map of this game, and also my favorite area. All we have to do is chip balls in front of the Buddha statue, and then we will be transported to the Hirata estate. Our objectives here are pretty simple. Get all the prosthetics before the first mini-boss and then kill the aforementioned mini-boss. This area is a bit tougher than the Ashina outskirts because the enemies have slightly weird attack patterns and they make use of two things that are problematic for us at this point. Those being fire and the British attack pattern. If anything, this place is pretty good to loot money and a few useful items. Another interesting thing about this area is that if you haven't died and you killed everything until the second idol, you should have almost enough experience points to get the most essential tool in our arsenal, the Mikuri counter. What I do is that I kill these guys two times and that gives me enough XP. After that's done, proceed to the area and get the flame barrel and the axe. Open the shortcut, go back to the temple to equip your prosthetics and then go to the first mini boss arena. There are two types of enemies in this area that piss me off, those being the bow guys and the axe guys. The bow guys will snipe you from a distance and if you're not paying attention they'll hit you and cause a little stun that can be enough for other enemies to capitalize on. The axe guys have a few hyper armor frames in their attacks, meaning that your attacks won't stun them if they're already in the middle of a certain animation. Again, if you're distracted, they will make you look like firewood. There's one bow guy and one axe guy in the mini boss arena. They are my highest priority targets. Even though I could just stealth death blow the first HP bar of the mini boss, having him and the minions on my tail is a surefire way to end my run. So let's just get rid of the minions first. And if I have to go through the mini boss's two health bars, then it is what it is. Thankfully, that's not what happens, as I did manage to get a stealth death blow on him after all. And he's piss easy with the Mikiri counter, so whatever. Now that we're done with him, we can go back to the Ashina outskirts and face the chained ogre. He enters a pretty lengthy stun stage whenever he receives fire damage, so now that we have the flamethrower prosthetic, he's going to be a lot easier. Though I would be lying if I said that the ogres haven't ruined a few runs for me, so it's best to be careful. You might think that it's not possible to do a stealth death blow on him, but all you need is a little bit of perspicacity. Near the firecracker vendor, there's a little ledge with a gachin sugar on it, which increases your stealth. We'll use that, get really close to him, and once the death blow marker appears and stabilizes, just like that, we skip the first stage of his boss fight. The ogre is a tough enemy because after finally getting an okay grasp on how the deflect mechanic works, the game throws you a curveball in the form of a Dark Souls boss. You need to fight this guy dodging and running, since he's equipped with a grab attack that will annihilate your health bar if it catches you. Thankfully, he's very susceptible to stun, and besides, there are other three bosses that worry me a lot more than him, so let's just put him to sleep for now. Right after the ogre, there's another mini boss in the form of a samurai. He's surrounded by minions, but by strategically picking each one of them off, our fight with him is a breeze. I can either go down this bridge or through this little passage. Well, we will go through the passage to unlock a completely useless shortcut, the difficulty increase, which I might use for a future run, and a mini boss, the Headless. I don't have the tools or the HP to safely deal with him for now, so we'll tackle him on a later part of the run. For now, just run like the little coward you know you are. Now we go down the bridge, through an encounter with a big danger noodle, and clear an area of samurais. And then we will arrive at our first real boss fight, an iconic one. What, I said iconic, not difficult. I beat him without dying on the first time I ever played the game. You can't even break your posture if you just hold down the block button. But I will give you a little tip in case you want one. Try to finish this fight right near these stairs so that you may immediately go talk to the Tengu and proceed with his quest. Get a few useful items and buy the gourd seed from the merchant in the castle. If you haven't died yet, you should have more than enough money to get it. Now go back to Gyobo's idol and kill these three little guys with your axe. They give plenty of XP so they're a good option for farming abilities in the early game. Go back to the Tengu, finish the quest and get the Ashina Esoteric Text. 
Now that we're done with this, we can go back to the temple, upgrade our guards and attack power, and if there's any specific ability you want to use, it's a good time to acquire it. If you like the Ichimonji, now's the time to get it. I personally don't like using it because it slows down my attack patterns, but whatever suits your fancy. Now, let's go back to the Hirata estate. From here, go for a swim for a little bit to get access to the passage that takes us to my favorite prosthetic, the Mist Raven Feathers. Kill the scarf and proceed to this little ledge, through this secret passage, climbing up the shaft, and reaching the top. Right here, we're going to have a bit of a hard fight, which is why I prefer to come here with upgraded attack power, more health and more guards. You'll see that in this fight I had a pretty close call. That attack missed me by inches. If it had gotten me, my first try at this run would be over. Anyways, we kill him, get the prosthetic, and proceed through my favorite part of the run. Standing on this part of the ledge, aim for the enemy closest to the bridge, jump and do an air death blow on him. The other three bow enemies are perfectly spaced for you to do a shuriken dash that kills them sequentially. You can kill the rest of the guys back on the path, but that's up to you. Proceed through the level as normal, but remember to come here through this little path to fight the two guys with the spears for some extra cash. They have the same moveset as the spear miniboss, but only one HP bar. A fun fact about this part is that I had no idea they existed until like a year ago when a friend of mine was describing this part to me. I thought he was f***ing with me because the only time I remember seeing these guys was way later in the game, but as it turns out, they're here from the start. Once you're done with them, get ready for a confrontation with two groups of annoying enemies and Juzo. There's nothing much to say about this first group, just be careful. As for the second one, you could ask the NPC for help, but I usually don't do that. This isn't a scenario where stealth will help you, because even with the gachi and sugar, Juzo will detect you. It can be a bit of a messy fight, but both he and his group are quite susceptible to you zooming around and picking each one of them off individually. I had a bit of a weird performance on this one, but I did manage to kill him eventually. My recommended prosthetics for this one is the flame vent for the boss, the axe for the shield guys and the shuriken for mobility, but that's up to you. Enter the mansion, go through this secret passage for some extra loot, and get ready for the confrontation with the boss that killed me the most out of every enemy in the game the first time I tried it. Lady Butterfly. My only recommendations for her is using the shuriken to knock her off the strings and watching out for her sweeping attack as that's easily the hardest hitting part of her moveset. That being said, there is a way to cheese her by simply sidestepping and attacking, but we don't do that here. I prefer a proper confrontation, and besides, it looks better on the montage. Sick, now back to the gate. Alright, now let us proceed through here as normal and get to one of the infamous run killers, the Blazing Bull. Out of the three bosses I said concerned me earlier in the video, this is one of them. Once again, the problem is that, like Yogur, he's not a boss that respects the deflect mechanics. Although you can deflect him, that chip damage from the fire will get to you eventually. And you can't properly counter him since the moment you let your finger off the block button, he will run you over. What I do for this fight is that I typically equip the firecrackers to get a few free hits in after the stun and the mist raven feathers to dodge the charging attacks. My strategy is to literally run as fast as I can and try to keep it to his sides. Even though hitting his head deals more damage, it also puts you in the most dangerous position, and we don't get second chances on this run, so I'd rather just keep it slow and steady. I always struggled with this boss from the beginning, but eventually I learned how to beat him sort of consistently, and thankfully this time was not an exception. Our next big boy to beat is Genichiro on top of Ashina Castle, but first we're going to make a little detour. Another interesting tidbit of information is that you can head into Genichiro's boss fight with 9 gore charges in total. Right now we have 4, but we can get 1 from the chest near the Endy Chamber Idol, 1 in the Sunken Valley, and 1 by trading with a merchant. There is also 1 in Mibu Village and 1 in Sempo Temple, but I am not going all the way there just to get 2 extra charges on my gourd. Other than that, you can also get an upgrade to your health before heading up the castle by killing the three mini bosses in the surrounding area and also trading one with a merchant. These guys will subtextually imply that you should have a certain prosthetic to fight the guy behind the gate, the spear prosthetic. But who needs spears when you have the power of stealth? I do, for a later fight. I got that and the Sabimaru and the Umbrella prosthetic and then headed up the castle killing every enemy except for the old ladies, until I arrived at another mildly concerning mini boss. You can't stealth him, not even if you come through that window with a gachi and sugar. You gotta face him head on, no bullshit. A lot of people say that this guy is easy, and yeah, when you can res he is easy. But I don't have that luxury. His attacks deal massive damage and they chip through your blocks if you don't deflect them perfectly. Feathers and fire will work well on him, but my best tip is just pay attention to when he draws his sword. With him defeated, we can move on to the real boss fight.
Genitro can be a bit intimidating, but he's hardly challenging. I would have done him hitless, but I got distracted because I was watching Juniper's stream at the same time that I was recording this part of the run. Regardless, he is a really fun fight, and he incorporates everything that Sekiro's gameplay has to offer. My favorite prosthetics for him are the shuriken and the feathers. A fun thing that happens after you fight this guy a hundred times is that you start to notice a few wild but interesting ways to counter his attacks. For example, instead of running from his grabs you can just keep attacking and it will knock him over, or you can sidestep his kick attack and hit him from the flank. Or, after he uses his bow you can use the shuriken to close the distance. There's not much to say in terms of struggle, but this part of the run is one that I always look forward to, it's always a blast having to fight him. Okay, not my cleanest fight, but a dub is a dub. Now we can talk to Kuro and have a small moment to boost your ego. Here he will ask how many times you died and came back to life for his sake. And there's a secret dialogue option if you haven't died until this point. Nope, I lied. There is no secret dialogue option, but it does feel good to know that you haven't died until this point. We can actually have another moment like this if you offer the Sakura drop that you gained from defeating Lady Butterfly. It should give you another res, but you're not using them, so you can just straight up tell Kuro that you don't need it. Good job. If you got here, the first third of the game is done. Talk to Kuro and then to Ishin and then to Kuro again and then we have a choice. There are three items we need to proceed with the story, each one found at the end of their respective areas. Those are the cool sword from Simple Temple, the flower at the end of the Sunken Valley, and the red sea urchin at the end of Mibu Village. Typically I go to Simple Temple for the sword first because it gives us a nice edge in the other fights. Then it's up to you. Typically I go to the Sunken Valley second and then the Ashina Depths third, not because it's more optimal, just because the day progression makes more sense this way. So from the entrance of the abandoned dungeon, we go through the cave and up the elevator to reach the entrance of the temple. Talk to the wall, take your pills for schizophrenia, and remember it takes a little bit of time for them to kick in, then proceed through the area. In my opinion, Simple Temple is the hardest area of the three, which is also part of the reason why I prefer to do it first. This way, if I die here, I didn't waste my time going through the other easier areas. The monks aren't too tough to deal with, but the ones with the staff can be a bit annoying. Plus, if you get careless, they can gank you pretty hard. Anyways, Gord Seed here, stealth through the helicopter monks and get the Shugendo Idol. There's a merchant down here and we're going to buy two scrap magnetite for later on. Now climb through the sides of the mountain and kill these annoying goblins. But before heading through the bridge, we're going to make a little detour to open the door to the demon bell. Why? No reason, it's just to complete the run. Now we can get to my favorite mini boss in Sekiro, the regular Dark Souls enemy. Do a little trolling and then proceed through the area, you should have enough beads for a new health upgrade by now. Kill the carps in the spawn and then kill the monks outside the building, then enter the building, kill the goblins and yoink this lump of fat wax, we'll need it for later. Now drop down and kill this dumbass and we can now enter the building with the next mini boss. My recommendation is killing these guys in the support mains first and then dropping down and doing a stealth death blow on the boss himself. While he's stunned, you kill the other guy in the room with him. End his misery and then keep going until you reach the last building of the map. Here we're going to have to deal with three helicopter monks, but through the use of Gachin Sugar and the Blood Smoke Ninjutsu dropped by Genichiro, we can dispose of all three of them very easily. Now through the cave to get our fourth exoteric text, and then through the building for our next boss fight. It's a puzzle fight, and I found a pretty optimal way to beat them. I personally hate this fight, so they don't get a montage. Wake up from your LSD trip, speak with this child for a cool sword and some rice, and onto the next map. Now from this idol in the Sunken Valley, which we got from the Ashina Castle section, we can continue through one of the most infamous run killers. Not this boss, she can f*** you up but she's not what I'm concerned about. No sir, what concerns me is this bridge. You see, there are 5 snipers in the cliff face and you cannot stealth through them. You'll be crossing this bridge and they'll be constantly shooting at you. Now, you may be saying, Hadel, yes that's how you pronounce my name, why don't you use the magnetic umbrella since it protects against projectiles? I used to do that until I found out that it's actually harder this way. There will come a point where you'll either have to fall into or make a jump over a gap in the bridge, and the best way to ensure that you won't be shot midair, which deals extra damage, is by running really fast. Literally just booking it to the other side of the bridge is safer, but that doesn't mean that it's entirely safe since you will still get hit. I actually lost a run in January after being shot by all 5 snipers at the same time while in midair and then I fell into the precipice for good measure. Even though I wouldn't have gotten a revive symbol for that death in particular, I opted for restarting the run because I wouldn't have let myself consider that run valid. There you go, I may be a bit of a masochist, but at least I have moral integrity. Kill the rest of the enemies in the gun fort and then kill this goofy ass mini boss to get a prosthetic that I've used maybe 6 times in my entire 500 hours of playing this game, and then get the loot in the rest of the cave. Now proceed through yet another area with a run killer, the big snake. 
Typically I use an ungo sugar to avoid being one shot but I have no idea if that actually works. As soon as the red kanji appears, jump off the bridge to the lake below and through this little rock and into the cave. Now you're safe. Get the idol and proceed through the monkey valley getting all the loot. There's a big group of monkeys here but we will deal with them right after getting our next prosthetic. Find the next idol, rest up and get ready. We are about to fight in Sea Dog VA. Remember when I said to get the spear prosthetic? It's for this part. Surely now he's gone for good. Get the flower, but before going back and continuing the main quest, we still need to finish some business in the sunken valley. Teleport back to the idol before the fight and head to the bottom of the valley. These white monkeys specifically are the single enemy I struggle with the most in the entire game. Thankfully the ones here can be very easily handled with through stealth. Literally just grapple above the first one and he won't notice you. But for the second one, you need to climb to this ledge and stay still for a few moments so that he can detect you. Once the marker goes yellow, crouch and wait until he's close enough to do an air death blow on him. Do with the rest, get the goodies and into the cave you go. There are two things about this cave that you should know. The first is that this is one of the few areas where I don't bother killing everything I see since the only enemies here are lizards and the souls of the damned trapped inside the walls. The other places I don't bother going through the work of killing everything are the reservoir part of the Ashina reservoir and the zombies in the abandoned dungeon. They are trivial enemies, not to mention boring to fight so we'll just ignore them. The other thing you should know is that this cave is really convenient because it gives access directly to the next area we're going to visit, but there's also a special item in it that we will not be using. If you're doing this part before Simple Temple, I have good news for you. If you don't have the marionette ninjutsu, don't worry, you can just use a Mist Raven prosthetic to bait the snake's attack and get past it. It's literally safer this way, provided you get the timing right. Now that we've gained an item that we will not use and access to the area that we were initially headed to, teleport back to the temple to get all the prosthetics and then teleport back to the sunken valley to troll the monkeys. Then teleport to Ashina Reservoir and go through the other way. We are being strict about completion here and at the very least I want to get all the idols in the game. Hey you forgot one at Hirata Estate. Shut up. Now that we're here, teleport back to the idol on the other side of the poison lake and systematically take down all the enemies before confronting the mini boss. It's the same thing as the one in the sunken valley, no need for ceremony. Collect the rest of the loot in the arena and... Remember the three concerning boss fights? This is the second one. It's the monkey again, but this time the fight is neither fun or fair. We handled the first phase without using any prosthetics or any special ability, so that in the second phase, when he calls on the second ape to go ape shit on you, no pun intended, we can handle them with the prosthetics. They are annoying, so they don't get a montage. What they get instead is an explanation. I use firecrackers, the mist raven and the mortal blade. Once the brown monkey appears, I try to carefully focus her down and kill her through HP. This fight is not one that can be done hastily, so if you're doing this without dying, take as much time as you need. These two have ended my runs more times than any other boss, so be careful with them. Me when I see a happy couple. If you kill the white ape first, the brown one immediately dies, but I personally have an easier time killing the brown ape first. Once you're done with them, upgrade your health and then continue through the area and do not teleport anywhere before you get to the next idol, since if you do, the double monkey idol will become inactive. Since it's chronologically dusk in the game, there are a few additional enemies that will appear in the maps. All areas adjacent to Ashina Castle will be infested with ghosts. The ones in the Ashina Deaths area are a bit annoying but nothing too worrisome, the mortal blade deals with them very easily. There's a little guy here but we will come back to him later, there's an item that I want to get first. Now this misty area is completely full with the spectral versions of the Hirata estate enemies. Once again, I don't bother killing them all because they will eventually die the moment I defeat one of the mini bosses in this area, so I consider that valid. Up through this little ledge and get ready for a confrontation with yet another recycled mini boss. It's literally just Juzo again. You fought him before and there's nothing new to him now. After the apes, nothing scares me in this game anymore. Yeah, I'll take the L. Overconfidence does that to you. Though this was the first death I've had since I started recording, I did waste like 4 runs trying to get to this point again, so we'll raise that count to 5. 
Thankfully you won't have to sit through them because I already did that for you. Took me roughly 3 hours in this attempt to get here again. Anyways, beat his ass and kill the joke boss and proceed through the area. This part can be a little tricky, so my recommendation is using a gachin sugar and rushing the first ninja with a mortal blade attack. Then just kill the other one normally and you'll be at the next part of the map. Welcome everybody to King Shinonuma. We have iconic enemies such as William Afton and normal dogs. Throw me to the wolves and I will come back pregnant. There's also a merchant here with very useful items for a later part of the run. We'll get almost everything in this store. Through the village, through the house, out of the house and into this area with the big tree. My pro tip to you is to avoid stepping into the cherry blossom petals because you'll be grabbed by this dumbass on the ground. They can be pretty annoying so deal with them with equivalent ordinance. Now, there are two items here in Mibu village that I want. One is useful and the other one is pointless. Let's get the pointless one first. Climbing the small hill behind the big tree, you'll find some guys working in the field. Use the marionette ninjutsu on the big guys and then immediately book it to the item at the top of the hill. As you're making your way back, four phantom nightjars will respawn, but if you convert to the big guys this battle will be a breeze. After you're done with them, proceed through the area and find the watermill idol. Something that I forgot to do here, but you should do, is to teleport back to Emma to upgrade your healing from the healing ward we got from the big tree. She will no longer be available after the next boss fight, so do that and then follow this path I'm taking here to get these two items. One of them is essential for our second to last boss fight. Deal with the guys that spawn below is optional, you can either ignore them or take them out. You choose. Now, back to the idol. Talk to the samurai guy and then continue through this passage to fight what I believe to be the hardest mini boss in the game. This is Orin of the Water, and out of every mini boss, she's probably the one who killed me the most when I first played. I remember recently finding out somewhere that she was completely optional, and all I can say is that, back in my day when I was playing this a few days after release, she wasn't optional. If you tried to walk past her, you'd just walk face first into a fog ball. Anyways, dispose of her, talk to the samurai again to complete his quest, and get a completely useless item for this run. Then continue through the path. Kill these guys, talk to the high priest, steal everything in his house, and onward to the wedding cave to face against the corrupted monk. I did a slow walk here for cinematics, but an excellent way to start this fight is to pop an Akko Sugar and immediately rush over to her and do two mortal draws. That will immediately lessen the impact of this boss's strength, which is her posture bar. A lot of people say that this boss has one of the largest and most quickly regenerating posture bars in the game, but honestly I think that's just a matter of finding good windows to damage her. And in my opinion, the posture bar is nowhere near as bad as one from a future boss we'll be fighting. In any case, the monk is a fun fight, and if you're done with her, you're about 60% of the way through the run. Into the cave, yoink the stone, and then back to Ashina Castle to talk to Kuro. Except we can't because every single idol except the one at the entrance of the abandoned dungeon has been deactivated as the result of the Afton infestation. Now we need to clear the entire region of the Ashina Castle again, reclaiming every idol and fighting tougher enemies in the way. The castle rooftop in particular is very scary. I accidentally got detected while trying to sneak, and I had a pretty close call here. I managed to survive and reach the antechamber, kill a few losers and reach the Ashina Dojo for our next mini boss fight. This guy has a ninja assisting him, so to make the fight a bit easier, we stealth kill the ninja and use a ninjutsu. Both the marionette and the blood sword technique will work pretty well, but through my experimentation I found out that the blood smoke ninjutsu does not work on mini bosses. This guy is pretty chill since he has the same moveset as the other purple ninjas, so nothing too worrisome about him. Ok, so now we should go to the top of the castle and face the next boss, but first we're going to run a few errands. And by errands I mean get the rest of the idols in Ashina Castle and kill every mini boss we ignored in the previous areas. First there's another chain ogre and then this guy. No fuss, no muss. The ogre can still nuke your health, but he isn't what concerns me, as we have now arrived at a part of the run where we have to kill a grand total of 6 mini bosses that all have the capacity to one-shot you. They are actually the reason why we got the purple guard and the umbrella upgrade from earlier, because those things will neutralize the terror status effect. First we'll go with the Shishimin warrior, since one of them drops an item that will help us with the next mini boss fights. The first one is here in the abandoned dungeon. Having the right tools completely trivializes this fight. He gives us the ceremonial tento, which in exchange for half our health would give us 5 spirit emblems. Is it a good trade off? Depends on how much you rely on prosthetics and combat arts. I use them a lot, so I like it. This one in the double monkey goon cave will give us a prosthetic upgrade, even though we will not be using it because it's way too expensive for what it does. Now we need to locate and kill the other mini bosses with the shitty one shot mechanic. So no head? This is the first one, and we completely ran past him right before we met the serpent for the first time. He's relatively balanced for the early game, so his HP is a little smaller than the other ones. The next one is in the hidden forest, and this motherfucker killed me. 
that's five hours down the drain. Tough luck, I'm back. Get his ass and onto the next one in the first part of the sunken valley where we got the extra prayer bead. To deal with these samurais, I recommend using a gachin sugar. Don't do what I did here, it's really dangerous to have this fight. We dive into the water and access the secret cave to get rid of the next one. And finally, there is one in the lake behind Ashina Castle. Now go over to Simple Temple, kill the noodle for 3 completely useless items for our run, and finally, now we can continue and face a boss fight that is much fairer than the whole shit we've just been through. Is this guy? I don't know, I'm not paying attention to the lore, I'm just here for the cool fights. With him out of the way, we can proceed to the next part of the run and perform a series of sneaky eavesdrops and dialogues to unlock a path that will give us the ending we are going for. Now back to the dilapidated temple, Emma will give us a new bell charm and using it on the bad trip statue will transport us to a different version of the Hirata estate, this time leveled for the end game. We need to face another purple ninja mini boss, but this one has the ability of summoning dogs. I won't be able to use it though, as I'll do my best to interrupt the summon animation every time it does it. Now we can keep going through the rest of the map. No, just kidding, this guy stunlocked me and ended my run. I got so pissed I almost rage quit at this time. I have to do all that shit again. Fucking ruin his existence and get to the next idol. An important thing I should say and that you probably already noticed is that I am dying a lot more in this later part of the game than I did in the beginning. And that can be explained by two very simple things. First is that, naturally, the beginning of the game is easier, and the latter parts increase in difficulty to keep up with the player's growth in skill, as you'd expect from games in general. But there is also the fact that dying means I get to practice the beginning of the game many, many times, and as a result, it becomes relatively trivial for me, even if Juzo clap my ass in a few attempts to recover this run. As a result, the further we go into the game, the less attempts I've had to practice it, and consequently, the late game has a lot less optimization and clean fights than the beginning. For example, in this Redux of Juzo, I tried to sneak death below the ninja, only to find out that the room is flagged for making the enemies detecting you after you get past a certain place. Not only that, but there are also like 6 or 7 regular minions scattered around the arena that I could have dealt with separately, but I completely forgot about him the first time I arrived here. Even though this fight was messy, I managed to survive it. Entering the mansion, we're faced with the two spear guys that I initially thought only appeared here. Anyways, let's claim the idol and head to the next boss arena. Well, look who it is again. An interesting thing that happens in these runs is that the main bosses are typically the easiest parts for me because of how much I practice them in the boss rush modes. I'm very used to their moveset, and I think I can count on one hand the amount of times one of them actually ended my run. This version of Owl is no different, and actually I think he's a bit more chill to fight against because he doesn't cancel my healing or use poison like he does in the Ashina Castle. But that's not to say that he's going to be a breeze the first time you fight him. His posture bar and health bar are enormous, probably the largest ones in the game. So this fight will take you quite some time, but rest assured that after you beat him, the run will be 80% concluded. Wait, he's my dad? Back to the wedding cave, 6 hours and 15 minutes into the run, we are now at the end game. First things first, get the idol here and across the bridge for probably the prettiest boss fight in the game. It's the monk again, but this time she means business. This fight has approximately 3 phases, and what I mean by that is that you can skip phase 2 if you correctly perform a death blow while the boss is doing the shadow clone jutsu. For the third phase, it's recommended that you equip the purple gourd and the umbrella because she starts to incorporate some terror inflicting attacks into her moveset. They are easy to dodge, but I'd rather not take the chance. Beat her ass and get the idol on the other end of the bridge, and get ready for entering what many consider to be the best area in the entire game. Welcome everybody to f***ing Watatsumi Island. Based on the information I've gathered from the voices in my head and one reddit thread, the Fountainhead Palace is a favorite for the majority of the players. I, for one, f***ing hate this place. 
Why you might ask? Simple. The tormented mind of Hidetaka Miyazaki decided it would be a good idea to litter this area with a shit ton of enemies that can either one-shot you or combo your ass out of existence. And I don't need to tell you how much of a nightmare it is to deal with this 80% of the way through a zero death run. In this cesspool of an area, we will have to deal with a total of 8 types of enemies that can completely wreck your shit, either through absurd damage or completely fair game mechanics. There's that, plus the fact that I've only ever reached this area in my zero death run once, so I basically have no practice here. All I have is the game knowledge I've acquired from the 8 new game plus cycles I have on my other save. I hope to god it is enough. We will use and abuse our old buddy the Gachin Sugar and make abundant use of the Sabimaru. This prosthetic is pretty bad for the majority of the game, but here it is literally the most powerful tool in our arsenal. The default enemies here in this area have a very low resistance to poison, and they get stunned as soon as one hit connects. The one saving grace of this area is that these particular enemies are completely trivial in one-to-one -one direct combat. After we're done with this initial area, we can head into the first problematic part of this map. This mansion is littered with a bunch of enemies that can quickly infect a status known as Enfeebled. What does Enfeebled do? Allow me to demonstrate in my other save. Yeah, quick application, and if it gets you, you're as good as dead. It won't even let you resurrect. Needless to say, our best course of action here is to be as stealthy as possible in order to not alert any of them, and in the off chance we do, we'll do our best to neutralize them as soon as possible. A funny little thing that might be relevant to you is that the shuriken dash does not work from a crouching position, so if you intend to rush one of the nobles, be sure to do so while standing. Even though this action is scary, it isn't too hard if you take a methodical approach. One by one, I managed to eliminate all the nobles and came back to loot all the goodies. What's that thing glowing behind the wall? You'll find out soon enough. Out of the mansion, turn left twice and hop onto the rooftops. Kill these bozos and prepare for yet another mini boss fight. Though he has more HP than his early game counterpart, you can get rid of around 40% of it by doing a stealth death blow from above. After that, it's the same hit and run tactics we use on the other one. He doesn't scare me as much as his early game counterpart because of this little trick, so that puts him solidly as only the sixth thing I hate the most about this map. Done? Good. If you've been following the same skill path as mine, you should have about 20 spirit emblems available for usage now. Congrats, they will come in handy later. Back to the idol and cross the bri- Never mind. We'll deal with that little shit later. He is like the serpent in the sense that it's a mandatory stealth section that will automatically kill you if you get detected. But unlike the serpent, I haven't done this action enough to memorize it, so every time I have to deal with him, there's a chance that he'll end my run. But it's okay, since there are a lot of other things that can end my run before we get to him. First we need to go through a relatively chill area. Emphasis on relatively. It simply consists of a few guys patrolling and playing kippy uppy about 300 years before soccer was invented. They're pretty okay to deal with. For these guys in particular, you can use the finger whistle, but I refuse to use this many spirit emblems for something so stupid. Just use the ceramic shard and draw their attention, then go behind them and use the blood smoke ninjutsu to deal with the rest of the group. The ones remaining shouldn't be too much trouble for you if you use the Sabimaru. Get the next title, use an eel lever and an ungirl sugar to be safe and dash towards this motherfucker. After you kill him, you'll be able to go to the water without the fear of being smited. Now we need to get to perhaps the most concerning part of this entire run since now we need to kill too many bosses with the terror mechanic. First is the Shishiman warrior by the waterfall. I heard that you can stealth death blow him, but I never managed to do it. He's no different from the other ones, just use the umbrella and he's done for. The next one is another headless. Two, in fact, since this one has a spirit version with the same moveset on the other side of the arena. The problem with the underwater headless fights is that you cannot use prosthetics or sugars or terror resistance items or even divine confetti. It's just you and the boss, and the most you can do is heal with the terror gourd. Thankfully his moveset is pretty easy, and if we take things at a slow methodical pace and focus them down, we can beat him without too much effort. That's not what I did here, I got greedy and I f***ing died when he was one tap. Goes to show how fair the terror mechanic is. If, perchance, you are a game developer, please, for the love of god, don't put instant kill mechanics in your game. This makes people like me very sad. I cannot emphasize how devastating it felt to die this far into the run. It takes the better part of a day to get to this point, and with every subsequent run I have less and less patience to go through the beginning of the game, which only makes me more prone to commit mistakes and die at an earlier section that I would otherwise have no trouble with. It took me more attempts that I'd like to admit to recover this progress. 
After you're done with this worthless piece of human shit, come to this little spot and use either an Ungo Sugar or a Gachin Sugar and then get ready to head into the cave of the car. Carefully follow through these little corridors and pay attention to the car's position. Get this idol and kill the things inside the house. They don't have the infillment mechanic, so they're pretty okay to deal with. Open this chest for a gourd seed and open the door for yet another useless shortcut. Now we can either go to the merchant for a few items that we will not use or take revenge on the carp for making me scared. We will do both. Now up the stairs to kill the final boss of this area. I cannot emphasize how good this challenge is for practicing stoicism. I genuinely had to put the game down and take a nap after this one. As I was saying, now go up these stairs and get ready to kill the final boss of this area. Remember when I said that there were three bosses that concerned me? Well, he is the third one. Oh, but Hadel, the Divine Dragon is easy. I know, I agree with you. He is easy to the point where I beat him on the first try during my first playthrough. He is made to have a lot of spectacle and very little challenge, and for that reason he doesn't even appear on the boss rush mode. And essentially what that means is that I don't have nearly as much practice with him as I have with every other boss. I lost my best run ever back in January to him, but that is not a mistake that I am letting myself make again. This motherfucker is going down. We are finally at the last map, but we still have a few things we need to do. Including, but not limited to, reclaiming every idol in both the castle and the outskirts region and killing the three mini-bosses in these areas before facing the two final bosses. First we need to cruise to the castle and get every idol we lost, and face the first mini-boss in Ishin's room. Right here. You can't stealth him, but he has red eyes, which means he's susceptible to fire attacks. Even though he can deal pretty massive damage, he shouldn't give you too much problem if you play it carefully. Now from here there are two other places we can go to, either the reservoir or the Ashina outskirts. I'll go to the outskirts first since the miniboss there is closer. Cross the bridge and get the idol under the valley and then stealth your way through these bozos. Our objective is to take out that little guy over there since he can alert the other enemies about our presence. I managed to get him but in the process I accidentally got spotted by the miniboss basically deleting my chances of getting rid of one of his health bars to stealth. According to the rules I set for myself, now I gotta fight him hand on so we'll just do that. He's basically a reskin of Juzo, but with armor and pyromancy. His attacks can annihilate half your HP, but fundamentally he has the same moves that we already know. Dealing with him is no different from the other three versions of him we've already defeated in this run. Just make sure to get rid of the minions first, cause otherwise this fight is going to be a nightmare. Now that he's dealt with, go back to the castle and head to the reservoir for the final miniboss. Pro Software's problem with recycled bosses really began here in Sekiro. Though this boss can be killed through stealth, I recommend that you take out the samurai minion first, because otherwise it will be a 2 on 1 on a cramped space that will absolutely ruin your run. Don't worry, if you got to this point without dying, I doubt that he will pose a challenge to you. Just watch your steps since everything around you is on fire. Now TP back to the idol under the bridge and continue through the outskirts. Nothing here should be too hard, but you should still be careful, especially with the chained ogre. Not to worry, they can all be killed through the same bullshit tactic we've been using the entire run. Into the fire we go for our second to last boss. I hope you have the fire umbrella prosthetic, because we are going to abuse it in this fight. I'm not gonna lie, I was a bit nervous about the meteor shower attack, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be, because the version I'm used to is killed for New Game Plus 7, and it can break your posture even with the umbrella. But other than that, I knew I couldn't take him on if I simply treated him as the Dark Souls boss that he is. Only one to go. At this point I was genuinely shaking. I had done this final boss countless times, and in the video about skill ceilings the background footage has one of the clips being me doing him hitless. But I was feeling far too nervous to have a performance as good as that. I've come way too far to fail here. This save has over 7 hours and 30 minutes at this point, and after the 16 attempts it took me to get here, I will not let this one go to waste.
I said this took me 16 attempts over the course of 3 weeks, but if we sum all the runs I tried to do it previously, I'd argue that this number is well over 50. There were times where I genuinely thought I couldn't do it, and rather counterintuitively, that feeling came to me most prevalently whenever I lost a really advanced run, especially to something stupid like Death 3. I could feel my heart physically sinking into my body knowing that I wasted hours and that I had made practically no improvements. But even in those moments, I knew I had the mechanical skill necessary. It was only a matter of avoiding making big mistakes for about 7.5 hours. If I had gotten to the Divine Dragon before, I knew I could get to Ishin. This was by far the second hardest gaming challenge I have ever done. I'm still trying to be ranked for Dash 2. It took me an inordinately long amount of time, but it feels immensely gratifying to know that I am maybe one of less than a thousand people in the world who managed to do this. That being said, the amount of time and willpower it took me to make this run is something that I'm not sure I'm ever willing to muster up again. 250 likes in all to Bloodborne.